or hypertrophy. We have a couple of kids who look at a barbell and blow up. So do they need to worry about hypertrophy? Probably not. Um, they need to worry about connective tissue strength, aerobic development, movement skills, stuff like that. Next block, maximal or explosive strength. Again, we've got a couple of kids who they're already at, you know, as strong as international props. We've got one 18-year-old kid who benches 180. Is he strong enough to play Premiership rugby? Yes, already. So he doesn't need to worry about that. He's got a high residual there already. He just needs to work on explosive strength. Is this in season? Yes, this is in season. So I'll, I've got an example of how I structure the week. So. Um, you know, but if you've got that skinny kid who's just getting sliced, he's probably going to benefit from maximal strength. Um, the third block is speed. Speed is non-negotiable. Everybody needs to be faster because it is the primary activity of the sport. Lastly is realisation. Putting everything into a match context so that when we do hit the grand final or the peak we've targeted, everything is coming together and everything we do is targeted on how are we going to play the game. It's not necessarily about uh, physical development. It's how, how are we going to translate that into a winning performance. Um, in terms of general philosophy, uh, high low approach. We talked about that wave, you know, peaks and troughs. If you continually stress the body without removing a stressor, you're not actually providing your body with the opportunity to adapt to that stressor, so you're not getting better. You have to follow a high day of training with a low day of training. Stress, recover, stress, recover, because stress, 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 it means you're going to play crap on Saturday and it means you're probably going to get hurt soon. Um, High and low approach, typically, because we are, you know, we have to do some endurance, but we are strength and power athletes. So we are limited by the central nervous system. The stuff we do is going to fatigue the central nervous system most. So we tend to alternate days of high central nervous system stresses, i.e., you know, max strength, speed, acceleration, very intense conditioning, with days of low CNS stress. So maybe assistance weights, aerobic development recovery modality, stuff like that. And structuring that approach, so, Monday, high day. Wednesday, high day. Friday, high day. This is pretty simple. Then you've got your low days. We've left 48 hours between central nervous system stresses, intensive stresses. So are we recovered by the time we train speed or strength again? Yeah. But on these days, we can still focus here because there's a different stress into the body on low intensity needs. So maybe a rate development, a little bit of hypertrophy. That allows you to train in a fashion optimally for speed and strength development while still targeting other stuff. Um, in season, um, one of your high CNS stress days is actually going to be the match. So we will typically go, this is because um, guys train with you know, partner clubs in the academy, they train rugby on a Tuesday and Thursday. So Monday is a low day, then we go Tuesday high day, Thursday high day, Saturday high day. And that leaves us Monday low day, Wednesday low day, Friday off for recovery, and then we get to Sunday off as well. So you have your three picks approach again. Um, maximal versus operational output, so I can talk about this a little bit, but basically, you have to train maximally to develop maximal abilities. You cannot, you cannot develop maximal strength in an elite athlete by training at 80% of one RM. You cannot develop maximal velocity by running at 80% of max velocity. Training has to exceed a certain intensity threshold to trigger adaptation. If you don't, you've just created fatigue without any of the benefit of adaptation. So it's high or low. Medium only works in clothing. It's like the way somebody told it to me once. Make your highs high, make your lows low. In the middle, you just fatigue someone without getting them better. Account for and attempt to account for all stresses being imposed on your athletes. Don't just look at how they are physically and what training they're doing. Ask them how they feel. You know, is the club short of money? Has their wife just left them? Did their dog die? Stuff like that. Try and be reactive and proactive. You know, you're asking them how they feel, account for that. Maybe account for the training that's coming, understanding that that's going to be a big stress on your athletes. 
doing that is going to allow you to select the most appropriate training load for your athlete at that time. What is optimal at one time is not going to be optimal at another. What's optimal for one athlete is not going to be optimal for another athlete. And that is the difficult thing in team sports because you have to account for 40 different levels of stress and 40 different you know, environmental stresses and where they are in the season and injuries and stuff like that. Generally, a personal record is a signal to move on to the next aspect of the program. Yeah. So I just going to ask, um, on a daily basis, do you do some different screening with the players? To Coming up. <laughs> um, personal record, move on. By definition, if you set a personal record in any aspect of your training, you've exposed the body to a level of stress which has never been exposed to before. So why would you expose an already stressed organism to further stress? You're just asking for a disaster. You've got what you came for, you've got a personal best, stick it in the bank and move on. There's certain things that we monitor all the time. Um, so I'll just, uh, what bike power output in six seconds we monitor and we also monitor broad jump um, that's because that's the only kit I have the, um, the first team monitor broad jump, vertical jump and the ratio between um, depth jump and vertical jump yeah. just to sort of assess how well they utilise them sorry? Yeah. no it's the first thing they do when they come in in the morning and then that will dictate the training for the rest of the day so for my guys it's um, they have to jump within 90 to 97 percent of their best um, if I'm going to this but if they if they jump within three percent of their best no choice you're, you, you're going to push the volume you're going to push the intensity anywhere between 90 and 97 uh, we let them select the, the volume based on how they feel anything below 90 percent is no CNS intensive stresses because they can't actually generate the level of output required to adapt so so, example, we've got a guy, a uh, bit of a space cadet, doesn't necessarily know his own body a little bit. Like, he got a concussion and then realised, he said, oh, I keep getting headaches, and then realised he had glandular fever. So, um, he is a really high power output athlete. His average broad jump was about 275 on a weekday. And he came in and I said, how do you feel, Liam? And he said, oh, I feel absolutely shit. I said, right, jump, 290. So... I said, you sure you feel shit? He said, yeah, I definitely feel shit. I was like, right, okay. We went and did strength. Um, I think prior to then, his best deadlift had been you know, like 170 for 10. I said, you know, do you want to, I think you should push it. He said, yeah, okay, 190 for 13. So the monitoring, you have to account for how your athletes feel, but the monitoring allows you not to, to second guess them a little, especially with athletes that maybe don't know their own body. My pictures have not come up. So um, I talked a little bit about the pre-season schedule. We have three high CNS days. Um, dependent on which phase of preparation we're in, uh, this, the high intensity sessions in the morning may be linear speed, multi-directional speed, or high intensity conditioning. Um, in the afternoon, that may be, it's typically gonna be weights. Um, then in the evening, evening, uh, the, the younger guys, 18 to 20, have partner clubs in lower leagues where they'll go off in the evening and train. Um, I schedule the high CNS stress days on those days because uh, I can absolutely guarantee they're going to be flogged at those, those sessions, no matter how politely we ask them not to, to account for the training. So um, in any situation, it's, it's typically got to be the S&C that bends first because the director of rugby is not going to change his program. The partner club is not going to change their program to accommodate your plans. Um, in season, like I said, we count the match as one of the high CNS days, which gives us two other days. Uh, sorry, I should have said, pre-season on the low days, we do stuff like um, extensive tempo, assistance weights, extensive bed board throws, and we work on the boring stuff, you know, FMS correctives, uh, mobility, flexibility, stuff like that. In season, pretty much the same thing, but we'll, dependent on the block, we typically stress the target ability of the block on the high CNS days. So for example, the boys have just started a maximal strength block. Our high days are Tuesday and Thursday. So we're gonna train whole body weights above 90% of one rep max on Tuesday and Thursday.